Is Larry jumping the gun here? This is like still four more minutes, five, right? <laughs> four minutes indeed. <laughs> Very efficient today. I usually go at 626, 627 to give myself a few minutes to uh, I usually. make sure everything's working like it wasn't just a moment ago yeah <laughs> that was right in queue right there Everyone is so quiet today or this evening. I, I assumed you could hear my keyboard going crazy. I'm sorry. <laughs> it must be the hail we all got. Well, I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year. I think this may be the last moment in January where you can actually still wish folks happy new year. It, it is still acceptable this evening. Right. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, six thirty, so I'd like to call to order the January tenth, twenty twenty three Pleasant Hill Planning Commission meeting. Can we have the roll call, please? Commissioner <clears throat> Commissioner Cheney here. Commissioner Cheney here. Commissioner Johnson? Here, with technical difficulties. <laughs> That's okay. Commissioner Vavrick? Here. Commissioner Vinson? Here. Commissioner Weiler? Here. Chair Colton? Here. Um, okay, thank you, Troy. Um, can we have staff introductions, <clears throat> please? Uh, certainly. This evening, um, staff includes Andrew Shiplett, Haley Crowfoot, uh, myself, Troy Fujimoto from the Planning Division, and then Ryan Cook from our Engineering Division. Thank you. Um, so I believe we have a housekeeping item here. Um, item three, I believe the applicant has asked to postpone. That's the uh, RPM auto collection use permit at 3264 Buskirk. So in case anyone is waiting to make a comment on item three, uh, that item will not be discussed tonight. So that item is being pulled. Okay. Um, moving on to public comment, uh, this is an opportunity for the public to make a comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. 
Uh, to do so, there's two ways. Uh, you can either go to www.zoom.us. Webinar ID is 882-8025-0550. The passcode is 362091. Or you can call 669-900-6833, star nine to raise your hand. Again, this is for comments on uh, non-agenda items. Do you have anyone in the queue, Larry? We have no hands raised or calls at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I'll close that portion of the agenda and move on to minutes. Uh, we have tentative minutes for December 8th, 2022. Uh, I imagine everyone took a look at those. If there aren't any edits, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the minutes of the meeting of the Pleasant Hill Planning Commission special meeting, December 8th, 2022. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Weiler and a second. I'll second. Commissioner Vincent. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Cheney? Yes. Commissioner Cheney? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Babbitt? Abstain. Commissioner Vincent? Yes. Commissioner Weiler? Yes. Chair Colton? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda are items that are considered routine and will be enacted on by one motion and vote. Uh, unless anyone wants to pull this item, uh, any commissioner can do so if they please. If anyone wants to pull that item, uh, now would be the good time to do that. If not, I'll entertain a motion for approval. I'll move that we approve the consent calendar. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Vinson. I'll second. And second by Commissioner Weiler. Can we have a roll call, please? Uh, Chair Colpin, before we take yes. that, you might want to just ask if there's anyone that wants to comment on the consent okay. from the public. Okay. Uh, is there anyone in the public that would like to comment on the consent item? No hands or phone calls at this time, Mr. Chair. Perfect. Thank you, Larry. Um, and since this wasn't a public hearing item, we'll just do the roll call. Troy? Commissioner Chiang? Yes. Commissioner Chiang? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Vavrick? Yes. Commissioner Vincent? Yes. Commissioner Weiler? Yes. Chair Colton. Yes. Thank you, Troy. Okay. Um, moving on to public hearing item number one, uh, PLN 22-0294, think as fence variance at 2029 Westover Drive. Um, I will open the public hearing and ask for a staff report. Thank you, Chair Colton. Uh, let me share my screen and let me know if you have trouble hearing me. We can hear you fine. Perfect. It's all good. Okay. Jump into slideshow here. Okay. Uh, this is a continuation of, a, of an item that was reviewed by the Planning Commission at the last hearing on December 8th, 2022. Uh, quick project description, just to review. It's an after-the-fact variance request to allow uh, a fence that was constructed in the front yard setback. It's a six foot tall fence uh, within that setback area where three feet is typically the maximum allowable area. And uh, the subject fence has a setback of nine feet, nine inches from the front property line where 20 feet is normally the allowable setback for a six foot tall fence. Again, on December 8th, the Planning Commission held a special public hearing where it reviewed and continued its review of the variance request. The commission at that meeting directed the applicant to work with staff to determine if modifications could be made to the fence that would resolve the existing nonconformity related to setback height and design. The commission also discussed the possibility of a minor exception, which could allow up to a one foot increase in allowable fence height within the front yard setback area for a total height of four feet and a minor exception, um, just for your information, would, could be reviewed by the zoning administrator, um, not by the planning commission. 
Uh, since the meeting on December 8th, planning staff did meet with the applicants uh, where the applicants communicated their desire to maintain the fence as is, uh, stating that the removal of the fence was cost prohibitive for them at this time. Uh, they determined that increasing the fence setback to 20 feet would be undesirable, uh, resulting in a greatly reduced area behind the fence. Uh, they discussed design alterations that could bring the fence into compliance including uh, with the design guidelines, I should say, including increasing the spacing between horizontal panels to create a more transparent look. They expressed interest in whether their fence would be permitted under a potential future ordinance amendment. And we also discussed the option of minor exception request. Uh, just to take a look again at the site, it's located on the northeast corner of Pleasant Hill Road and Westover Drive where that red star is located. Uh, some of the uh, characteristics of the intersection that the applicant described in correlation with their fence variance request was that the intersection has changed since they purchased the home. So we're providing some before and after comparison photos uh, after the public works department um, uh, instituted their, their uh, beautification project along Pleasant Hill Road. As you can see, it didn't really increase the lanes on the road. It didn't result in any sizable increase in traffic volume. Um, it really just added landscaping and bike lanes and some other beautification. Here's some before and after shots that we captured of the subject property on the corner, showing the uh, property before the installation of the fence and after the installation of the fence. The top two photos up here are, look, are taken from the intersection of Pleasant Hill Road and Westover. And the two shots below are taken from across the street, looking sort of in the opposite direction at the property. And then here's another shot looking westbound along West uh, Pleasant Hill Road, pardon me. Uh, so if you're approaching the intersection of Westover, the applicant's property would be on your right-hand side. Uh, here's a closer up uh, view of the fence that's being reviewed. Uh, it's a wood horizontal slat fence with wood posts, four by four posts holding them up and a metal uh, two framed construction uh, holding the gate. This is the site plan the applicant provided showing their entire property and we'll enlarge it a little bit to focus in on the fence, showing the location, uh, their front yard, property line, the fence is set back approximately nine feet, nine inches from that property line, uh, sort of in, in alignment with the front face of the home, which has a legal non-conforming setback. The front door is located here in this little pocket area. And then the, the rest of the front of the elevation of the house is this line right here, uh, just beyond the 20 foot setback. Uh, to make the findings for a variance, uh, we'll remind the commission that the variances would need to be based on the existence of special circumstances applicable to the property, including size, shape, topography, location, or surroundings, such that the strict application of the zoning regulations deprives the property of privileges enjoyed by other properties in the vicinity under the identical zoning classification. Also, number two, the variance does not constitute a grant of special privileges inconsistent with limitations on other properties in the vicinity and zoning district. As well as number three, the variance substantially meets the intent and purpose of the zoning district in which the property is located. Uh, staff's analysis of these findings and the project proposals that the size, the shape, location, and topographical characteristics of the property are typical of other properties in the zone district. And thus the property is not deprived of any privileges that other properties are able to enjoy. Allowing a variance for a six foot tall fence could be seen as the granting of a special privilege for this reason, because it would not be consistent with limitations applicable to other properties. And the variance request does not substantially meet the intent, therefore, and purpose of the R10 zoning district. Staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission hold the public hearing, receive public comments, provide input and comments to staff and the applicant, and if uh, necessary, adopt the proposed resolution to deny the variance request. 
Thank you, and I'll return it to the Planning Commission. Thank you, Andrew. Um, is the applicant here? One moment while I bring him in. Thank you. Um, does the commission have any questions for staff at this point? I see Commissioner Vavrick. I just like to make a comment since I wasn't at the last meeting, I did review the video of that meeting. I've also reviewed uh, the staff report and all of the public comments that came in um, with regard to this item. So I will be voting on this item this evening. Perfect. Commissioner Chang. Yes, I do have a few questions for staff based on what I read um, in regards to the applicant having met with staff post the December 8th meeting. Uh, my first question is whether the, the proposed fence design modification is considered more transparent. Uh, the uh, sketch that was included with the agenda attachments, I believe shows a one inch gap between varying sized um, heights of boards. And so my question is uh, to staff is whether that design constitutes a more transparent design. And um, I can continue with my questions or, or wait for your response and move on to my next question, Andrew. Um, your question about the the transparent look of the fence yes with the um, modification to the design is that considered a more transparent design i think that it's uh it's moving in the the direction of a more transparent design that might be something for for consideration tonight by the planning commission whether a one inch gap would achieve that um if there, if the commission feels like a larger gap would be appropriate for transparency, um, we could ask the applicant to provide additional options for redesign. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chadwick. Thank you, Commissioner Shane. Uh, it sounds like if we were to adopt the resolution denying the variance and the applicant went through the minor exception process, that they're going to be subject to staff review and approval of the proposed alternatives. So I think it would be my preference that we as the commission kind of make an agreement if we wanted to settle on alternatives, because I, I can see how we might adopt the proposed resolution, perhaps, depending on what the commission feels. And then the applicant goes the minor exception route and then we maybe end up with another meeting such as this. So um, I think I have the same question as Commissioner Chang. Is the proposed alternative as it stands now, would it be satisfactory for uh, meeting the transparency requirements? Um, I'd like to get that settled tonight if we could, if we're making decisions. Okay. Does anyone else have questions for staff? Commissioner Chang. Yes, I'm sorry. I have two more questions. Okay. Uh, my second question is what, and this may have been discussed in the previous meeting, and I just don't remember, what are the impacts to the applicant for delaying compliance if they choose to wait for a future ordinance amendment? Uh, Commissioner Chang, if, um, if the commission were to deny the request, uh, then we would then work with the property owner for a time frame for removal of the fence. I couldn't tell you specifically what that would be at this time. Every case is different, but that would be the next step. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, and my last question is, if the fence height is reduced, whether it's to the three foot, three foot compliance height or the four foot minor exception height, and the design is made more transparent, can it remain in the place uh, nine foot nine from the property line? would it then be in compliance? Uh, I believe the answer to that question would be yes. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so the three foot height or a four foot with the approval of a minor exception for an additional 12 inches. <clears throat> there's, just to piggyback, there's no setback requirements on those shorter fences, right? Like they can go all the way up to the lot line if they wanted to, theoretically. 
Theoretically, that is correct. Thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. Does anyone else on the commission have questions? I see Commissioner Cheney. Uh, what's typically the requirements to get that variance to go from the three feet to the four feet? Is there usually criteria that's considered for those? Uh, yes, there is. There's findings for a minor exception, uh, just like there are findings for a variance. They're slightly different, and they're predicated typically on uh, some sort of practical difficulty with achieving a compliant uh, structure. So in this case, uh, the applicant could submit a minor exception application and submit uh, their own findings for why they would qualify. Um, you know, that's it, it's sort of left up to the applicant to, to determine what their practical difficulty would be. Uh, so it's hard for me to answer that question. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else have questions for staff or the applicant? Yeah. Seeing none. Uh, oh, Mr. Chang, go ahead. Uh, I do have a question for the applicant um, and whether they had considered removing the horizontal slats on the front frontage portion of the fence and replacing it with a vehicular, a transparent vehicular barrier system and having vegetation within the setback zone, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase, between the property line and where the fence is currently located. So um, to rephrase my question, has the applicant considered um, a transparent vehicular barrier system and vegetation in lieu of the solid fence material? I guess that's, that's me to answer, right? Yes. Um, so I, I actually don't know what a vehicular um, a structure is, what you're referring to exactly. I don't know if you could explain it. It would be a metal mesh or cable system that is um, able to resist barrier uh, forces from uh, a vehicle striking the system. Okay, yeah, I understand. Yeah, we um, that has not been um, discussed. Obviously, we do. We um, that would be something new to us, but I don't think we would actually want to install something like that per se, just because I don't think that would really do the area justice from an aesthetic standpoint, um, as we're kind of a pretty pretty significant um, uh, focal point when you enter the entire Westover neighborhood. Um, but I mean, that that is, you know, I, I appreciate you that suggestion, because that is kind of, that was our intent to provide kind of a multi-purpose fence that not only kept the kids safe, um, but it also detracted from a lot of the exterior light from the new lighting and, and cars. Thank you for your response. Hey, okay. anyone else? Okay, um, Mr. Finkus, I know that you've spoken to us last time, so I just want to give you an opportunity to, to see if you had anything else to add or anything else you wanted to address at this point before I open it up for public comment. Um, yeah, am I able to share possibly my screen? Because I did want to show um, the initial presentation that we had. We actually didn't have a presentation because we weren't we weren't sure what we were going to kind of encounter on this last time. Okay. But we put together something that I think might paint a, a different picture for those that ha actually haven't been to the property and seen um, and seen it in person. We just wanted to make sure that you guys had that kind of info um, readily available before a vote was okay. cast. Okay. Andrew or Troy, do we have an ability to uh, provide that opportunity? And if so, um, how much time do we usually give to the applicant to do that? Uh, Chair Colfin, I believe. It's 15 minutes. Applicant can share their screen, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, if you, it's, you know, I don't know how long the presentation is, but. No, it's like, I mean, maybe five minutes. It's, it's, yeah, it's pretty That's, brief. Yeah. That would be fine. Okay. Perfect. Uh, well, if you have the share screen function. On I'm looking and I don't. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's a little tab. Okay. Yep. I'm going to go right. ahead and I'm going to go ahead and do that. 
Thank you for that, Troy. Okay, are you guys able to, to see the big screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so mm -hmm. really kind of what I wanted to accomplish here was um, was really emphasizing kind of the setback that the fence currently is at in relation in relation to the street, um, the center of West Overdrive. Um, technically, due to the um, the actual uh, property line, and I'll get right here. So this next slide shows kind of like what uh, Mr. Shiflet showed as well. Um, the the current fence situation right here, and the curb. That is um, that is mentioning these these sizes, but let me go to this next page real quick. Sorry. Okay, if you can see this, um, the nine foot nine inches right here, that ends at the current face of the new fence, and our property line. Um, the property line is actually four feet. Um, actually, it's more than four feet um, uh, from the actual beginning of the curve. So all of this until you see this curb is all of our new landscaping that we have here. So it's tr it's really from the fence, the front of the fence to the beginning of the curb is 16 feet. If you go ahead and take into account the extra four feet from the actual curb, that's 20 feet that the fence is actually set back to the very, to the inch from the beginning of the curb. So really what we were trying to kind of, um, uh, portray here is that the nine foot nine inches seems um, and the the exception that we're asking for is um, technically 10 feet but really if you look at the property as a whole from um, you know the 16 feet we're only asking for four feet to uh, you know to not have to spend all this money to remove this fence or to alter it this much um, here's a couple other just photos from the outside of the house. And this kind of shows another picture of how far away it actually is from the street. This also shows that there are, you know, there is some, you know, some uh, light that does come through these, uh, these slats I kind of mentioned to you guys last time, I'll move on, but um, we wanted to make sure that you guys were, there are a few, uh, few letters that were sent in um, pretty late, I believe maybe today or yesterday. Um, this was from, I'm not sure if you guys had a chance to read this, from the original homeowners from the 1950s. Can, can anybody confirm that you guys were able to kind of, that each of you yes. guys were able to read I this? I saw okay. it. Cool. Yes, okay. we saw it. Okay, thanks. All right. So this, I did want to um, emphasize that, you know, this street has become, you know, more busy and uh, there, if there is an actual um, actual review of the traffic I, that you guys could provide. I, I think it's pretty, we're pretty sure that we're going to see that there's more traffic on West Overdrive. Um, in the past, and it looks like from the 50s and the 60s, there were a couple accidents here that actually um, occurred in the front of our property. There was a tree here that was removed um, by us about seven years ago because it rotted out, it was a, so it was falling that prevented actually a car from penetrating the front of the garage, which is the living room of the house. Um, also just right around the corner there, back in 2018, there was also a death from another car speeding down west over or down Pleasant Hill Road, not even less, less, than, less than 100 yards from our house. We, we wanted to make a, um, a few examples of other properties that are within one mile of our house that are with their fences at least six feet high that are actually on the side, butting up against the sidewalk. So not only is it, a, it's not a minor exception, these are six foot tall fences. This one is four and a half feet and goes up to five and a half feet right on the sidewalk, less than 20 feet from the center of, of Pleasant Hill Road. And this is on, and keep in mind, this is on a two-lane road, where we are, where we are situated. It's a that's a four-lane highway at the at a street line, actually. And this, and we didn't have to go far to gather these. So there's a lot of these. This is on a quiet cul-de-sac, or not a cul-de-sac, just a normal street in Pleasant Hill. Another fence, six feet tall, much further up to the curb than ours. 
Um, and I just wanted to kind of give those as examples as, um, because I think we are in a unique circumstance with where we are as a property um, and in relation to the, to the street um, and to the elevation of our house being completely level with the busy street. Um, if, if there was a review done of other properties within the, um, within the, in, within Pleasant Hill on four lane roads with street lights, um, at, you know, at an intersection, you'll find very few. I mean, I could count them on two hands, how many you'll find. And we've done the research on this. So we think that if, um, there was a special circumstance granted for this house, um, it's, it is a very unique situation that you guys wouldn't be inundated with multiple requests from other houses because you would have the uh, specific um you would have the specific criteria that somebody would need to have that you know, with regards to our house essentially um this was a, the last slide is i, I kind of wanted to show that on, on some of the analysis that was given to you guys um for the um hopefully you can see as let me see if i can zoom in a little bit i don't think i can zoom in but this was given to you by um by Mr. Shifflett, I believe this was their uh, their analysis, and that it specifically says that there was, you know, when the renovations were done to the Pleasant Hill Road, um, uh, uh, whatever you call that, the uh, the road improvement, roadway improvement plan, that there were not additional streetlights um, put in. There were mo we have emails from Deidre, who is with the uh, I think she's with the engineering team. Um, you know, saying how many more streetlights were actually put in right next to our house that does um, also severely impact our quality of life. And in addition to the fence being a safety thing for us and our family, it also provides a little bit more quality of life for us and blocks out a significant amount of that new light that is there. That is it for me on the presentation uh, in terms of the, the share. Hopefully it wasn't too long. Hey, uh, thank you for that, Mr. Finkus. Does anyone have questions for the applicant at this point? Okay, seeing none, I will um, turn to public comment. And again, um, to comment on tonight's meeting, uh, there's two ways to do that. Uh, first option is www.zoom.us. Webinar ID is 882. 8025-0550, passcode 362-091, or uh, call 669-900-6833, star nine to raise your hand and to get in the queue. Uh, Larry, do you have anyone waiting to make a comment? There are no hands raised or calls at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, seeing no raised hands, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for further consideration and discussion. I see Commissioner Johnson has her hand up, then Commissioner Vincent. Um, sorry, I couldn't raise my hand fast enough before, but I actually have I need, was one. I have a question for of clarification from Mr. Finkus. Um, I just wanted to clarify, are you saying that your actual property line encompasses the sidewalk? So it goes to the face of curb, or are you saying that it, it goes to the back of curb? Yeah, sorry, it's hard for me to, um, to explain that, uh, capture that properly. So the property line is essentially, so we, the front of our house is all gra is all like gravel hardscape, essentially. Um, technically, four feet of that is the city's is the city's uh property line and then the sidewalk begins so kind of what i was alluding to before is if you know we're essentially taking care of that four feet um of that property that's the city's property if that was taken into account with the the uh, feet the footage that we are um asking for it would the you know we think that it would be a much easier pill to swallow essentially for you guys it, it wouldn't be of 10 feet we're asking for um, to move the fence back, it would only be four feet actually. To make it to make it in compliance basically with a 20, you know, 20 foot setback. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, Mr. Shiflet, um, can you clarify if at the at the front of that property if it's a public right of way or if it's actually the city's property? 
Mm. Yeah, I can clarify that the curb and the sidewalk and like Mr. Fink has alluded to um, a portion of his front landscaping area is in the public right of way. Uh, Westover Drive is a 60 foot wide public right of way. And so their front property line is approximately 30 feet from the front, I'm sorry, the center of Westover Drive. So what we do is we measure 30 feet from the center of the road and that's where their property line is uh, as well as the edge of the public right of way. And then from that property line, there's an additional 20 foot setback requirement. Understood. Thank you. Any more questions? I see um, Commissioner Vincent, uh, do you have a question for the applicant or staff? For staff. Okay, so um, does anyone else have questions for the applicant? If not, I'll ask um, Larry to take the Mr. Finkus out so, so we can bring it back to Commissioner for consideration. I see Commissioner Weiler's is for the applicant? Yes, it's for the applicant. Okay. Um, in the hypothetical uh, situation where maybe we changed our design guidelines for corner lots or what have you, but the commission still desires that the transparency requirements were kept, um, are you able to meet those requirements? I mean, I don't know what, what the commission is going to go tonight, but um, it sounds like based on last month's discussion, the transparency requirements were still significant. And even if we did allow for a variance on height, it would still be out of compliance with that. Do you have a plan to uh, mitigate for the transparency requirements? Yeah, we're, we're, we're more than willing to work on those kind of things with, with the city. Um, we want to find a resolution that, um, that doesn't really um, severely impact us financially, to be quite honest, um, because we, we spent almost everything we had to redo the front of this property and the back of this property almost $70,000. Um, and it, so it would be a pretty big hardship um, to have to kind of re really have that um, severely taken down and um, essentially redone. So we're willing to work with, um, with the city for sure. And that's why I was trying to kind of bring to light, like, you know, ideally, I think that this thing should be discussed further as an ordinance amendment due to the very few actual properties that share kind of um, share what we have here on the corner in this specific area. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Vavrik, is this for the applicant or staff? Uh, for the applicant, since I Go guess the, that's the hearing is still open. Um, just to confirm, well, Mr. Fink is... Well, I I, uh, I uh, did close the public hearing. That's what I thought, but now it yeah. seemed to be open again because that's, people were asking right. questions. So if it's closed, so, then that's fine. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple of things we could do. I can either re reopen and we can just maybe finish with, with the questions and then I'll then have to close it and we'll take the applicant out and bring it back to the commission. Um, so, what, so, okay, go ahead. so why don't we do that? Uh, so... Troy, are you fine with that? Yeah, that's fine. You can reopen it. Okay. So I will go ahead and reopen the public hearing and because we have some more questions for the applicant. Go ahead, Commissioner Fabric. Well, the only question I have is since there's a discussion here going on about, um, you know, construction cost and whatnot, is that Mr. Fink is, um, I believe from our staff report that um, this construction was reported when it was underway, and um, there were discussions between you and the staff um, with regard to the fact that this was probably not going to meet the city ordinance, and you elected to continue with the construction nonetheless. Is that accurate? Correct. So we, the, um, the fence was, um, I think as Andrew can kind of agree, it was mostly complete at that point. So we just, you know, it was, do we not have these guys finish the job? They're charging us the same amount anyway. So it was already kind of a done deal, essentially. Okay. Um, any more questions for the applicant? No, uh, Larry, anyone in the public that raised their hand 
to make a comment? We have no hands or phone calls, Mr. Chair. Okay, perfect. So I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and um, bring it back to the commission. And Larry, if you can take the applicant out of the room, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Finkus. Um, okay, so um, this I see Commissioner Vincent. I just have a follow-up question for Andrew. As far as the way the city measures a setback, on the front of the house, it's still the nine feet, nine inches? Uh, Commissioner Vincent, could you rephrase that question? Are you asking well, for the, the, the applicant uh, was making an argument that the setback is more than the nine feet if you measure into the street? But based on the way the city would determine the setback, it's only nine feet something? Uh, yeah, the setback for the fence as it's built is currently nine feet, nine inches. Thank you. And that's, yeah, measured from their property line, not from the curb or the sidewalk. Thank you. Is that a true property line or an approximation from the middle of the road? That's an approximation from the middle of the road. Commissioner Johnson. As measured by staff, I would I would add. I just wanna um, try to circle back um, with that question is that the property line is, is where it is. That's a non-negotiable thing. What they were requesting what, from my comprehension is that the applicant was requesting that we consider a portion of the city's property as theirs to be considered in their setback because it's landscaped area. And they're, they've essentially elected to, um, to maintain that area. But if I'm not mistaken, the city can't just give over land without some other additional processes um, so the property line is at the nine foot um, setback from their fence line, and it's it's not in compliance. Yeah, I can concur with that. I think the applicant was suggesting that visually um, it's more or less 16 feet from the sidewalk or curb, um, but that's not how we measure setbacks. So we measure them from the property line. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, Commissioner Johnson, go ahead. Um, I also think um, Commissioner Vavrick, Vavrick um, brought up a really good point because I did forget that, you know, the fence was incomplete when, um, when the applicant was confronted. And from that, it sounds like it would have been less of a financial burden if they would have, you know, kind of rectified it at that moment. And, lowered the fence to at least meet the um, the acceptable height. Any more comments? Commissioner Chang? Uh, I'd like to bring back the transparency question. Do any of the commissioners, um, based on the supplemental follow-up information provided by the applicant, believe that the modified design meets the intent of the transparency. And um, Andrew, I don't know if you can pull that up. There was a, I think there was like a hand sketch included in the attachment. Yes, I should be able to pull that up for you. I think what I saw was uh, a few additional gaps, but I couldn't really tell because the sketch was quite small. So I wasn't sure what I was seeing here. <laughs> it, a repeated pattern of five and a half, one inch gap, three, three inch board, one inch gap, two inch board, one inch gap. That's repeated four times over the height of the six foot fence. I think that's what I took away, Andrew. I don't know if that's correct. Uh, that's what I took away as well. Okay, and so, um, to restate my question to my fellow commissioners, do we believe this modified design is meeting the intent of the transparency for our 10 zoning district? I, I do not. And I'll just say that um, it, uh, it's a little bit of an odd question because the first question in my mind is what should be the height of the fence? And then the issue of transparency comes into it. 
Um, so I don't see this as meeting any requirement. It's still at the six feet. And, um, you know, the intent of the ordinance is, you know, first of all, we deal with the height and then we deal with the transparency because I don't, I don't believe that this meets the requirement. Okay. Yeah, um, I have the same stance. Um, I can't recall, I felt like the transparency was more so as a, like it was desired for safety measures, like if there's emergency at the house. And so if that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if that is in fact the case, I would think if emergency, if the police department or ambulance is rushing to the house, try to look through a one inch gap would create quite a um, obstacle for them. So I still feel like it's out of compliance. I can't see the screens. I'm raising my hand, but I can't see the other commissioners. But I had a similar thought. If there was a burglar alarm that went off and the police were responding, I don't think they can really see what's going on at the front of the house. Well, you know, I'd just like to make another comment, which is, you know, the design guideline is not, is there, we're, we're focusing on this um, transparency part of it, but there's a reason for the transparency and that is to preserve the open appearance of the lot. And so, you know, I think the two things have to work together. In other words, you know, you have to have the right height and then the issue of the construction uh, becomes the second part of the discussion rather than starting with, the with that as the first part. I think the first thing is the height and the position of of the fence uh, on the lot. Uh, sure, Vincent. I'll, I'll uh, jump in and go to more of our discussion about this. I would have a hard time supporting this uh, variance because it, it's not a minor change. The uh, fence is twice as high as it should be. And it's uh, half the distance, the, the setbacks, half of what it, it should be. So that's about a major change. Uh, and I did notice that they were, they were asked to stop the construction and they kept uh, working on it. Uh, I think there are ways to address the safety concerns that they've raised uh, without having this, this type of fence. Uh, you know, quite frankly, when they bought the house, they knew there was traffic there and that was an issue that would need to be addressed. And I have, I'm challenged by a variance like this being brought to us after the fact. And there were some other fences shown. I have no idea when they were built, whether they were the same guidelines or whether they were granted variance for some reason. Uh, and I noticed that there is a lot of public comment on this, but a lot of it just addresses the, the look of the fence. It's not clear to me that a lot of the public who commented actually knew what the uh, issues were as far as the setbacks and the height and the transparency. So I really can't make the findings to support the variance as it stands. Commissioner Chang and then Commissioner Weiler. Uh, the reason why I asked my original, one of my original questions was in reference to if the height of the fence were reduced to either the in compliance three foot or the minor exception four foot, that it could remain in its place and be in compliance. And then agreed with Commissioner Baverick that the transparency is the secondary issue. But I guess I was assuming and did not follow up whether or not the applicant would be willing to uh, modify the fence height. Commissioner Weiler. I was kind of uh, following the same train of thought that Commissioner Chang was um, because I, I was foreseeing a situation where we follow staff's recommendation, but then the proposed or the alternative solution also uh, is denied. But then I, and this is probably a follow-up question for staff, I can't remember, <clears throat> does the three foot tall, or perhaps a four foot tall fence with minor exception, <clears throat> does that have the same transparency requirements? Because I, I, all around the city, you see solid half height fences, you see picket fences, you see the deer fences, it's a hodgepodge of three foot fences up to the lot lines out there. Uh, Commissioner Weiler, our design guidelines and 
to reinforce that they are guidelines it talks about front yard fences being open work transparency so for any front yard fence whether it was the yeah, free foot stuff yeah um personally if it's a safety aspect a free foot or four foot tall fence a police officer could see over so I think that if, if they went with the proposed alternative on a three or four foot fence, I couldn't see that working better than uh, the six foot tall fence. Commissioner Fabric. Well, I'm just gonna start <laughs> sort of summing up here. Um, I cannot make the findings for a variance here. Um, there is, uh, the, the location is not unique. Um, we have many corner lots in Pleasant Hill that experience, um, you know, the same conditions of traffic that um, that this lot experiences, and I think that that, uh, in my mind, would prohibit doing any kind of ordinance change because we would basically have to allow something like this on every corner lot in Pleasant Hill. If I had a corner lot and this was, a, I would argue that my corner lot would had the same conditions. So um, I don't see going that direction at all. I think our ordinance is well drafted the way it is right now with regard to this fence. And I think that my recommendation would simply be to go with the um, staff um, alternative that is in the um, report, which is to basically deny the variance and let the applicant come back um, for a minor exception, which would allow for, if, if granted, would allow for a four foot tall fence. But I really think that, um, you know, this is something that just really should not have been built. I'm sorry that, that it went forward the way it did with, um, even after being discovered to be out of compliance, that was an unfortunate, decision that the applicant made, but you know they're allowed to make that kind of decision. Then, then it becomes ours to determine whether this is consistent with um, the intent of our zoning ordinance. And in my mind, there is no way to make these variance findings. There's simply nothing unique about this lot. So I'll stop there for now. Okay. Um, anyone else? No? Troy or Andrew, I have a question for you. Um, do we know when was the last time that we amended uh, our ordinance dealing with fences in Pleasant Hill? Uh, I don't know when was the last time we amended our ordinance, but we did amend our ordinance for minor exceptions to allow an additional foot for uh, front yard fences for um, through the minor exception process where that wasn't even allowed in the past. Yeah, so I'm thinking more of a citywide type of thing. Um, and and the reason why I'm bringing this up because I'm I completely understand where Commissioner Vavrik is coming from. Um, and I do agree with you on a lot of those points. My my only sort of thought is that I, I I can't help to to sort of think that corner lots just fundamentally act differently um, than even my lot, right? I mean, I'm by surrounded by two neighbors. Um, you have cars turning from each direction constantly, so I I, I could see a situation where perhaps there is an opportunity to look at a more of a larger discussion that has nothing to do necessarily with this house uh, or this particular lot. Um, Cause I'm not an expert at corner lots. And so I, I, I don't know sort of what conditions exist there. And the reason why I asked when the last time we looked at something like that, cause I would be curious to know if there is more lighting coming to the lot from the more cars turning onto the street um, I would know if there's more noise. I would like to know that. Um, you know, is there a safety issue because there is more potential foot traffic there? All of those questions I don't have the answers to. Um, it this is quite frustrating because we're dealing with this issue after the fact, and it would have been extremely helpful if the applicant came to us beforehand and said. 
this is what I'm trying to do. And we could have had this conversation, but that's sort of a mute point at this point. We have a fence that's, that's not compliant. And, you know, as I drove around town this weekend, I saw a whole bunch of fences just like that. Um, six, six feet tall. I mean, right in the middle of the block, fairly new construction. So is it just a matter that no one has actually said anything and that's why the applicant's not here too? I don't know, but they're not compliant. So, you know, I I feel challenged to, to basically say, go ahead and remove this fence because, you know, you build it and it can't be there. Although I agree with that. I, I just wonder if there is a larger conversation to be had about the experience in corner lots and whether or not there really is a need to have a six foot fence there. Like, I just cannot answer that question. So I would not be against taking a look at an ordinance citywide that just looks at corner lots. That's just me, I'm just speaking for myself. Now, I understand there's other issues with this fence. Um, I do have a problem with it being sort of a solid piece that you can't see through. And perhaps that's a discussion that staff could have with um, applicant to see if there's any more things that could be done uh, for it to be a little bit more transparent. Um, but again, I, I would be in support of looking at um, a citywide ordinance that deals with corner lots. And Chair Colfin, to be clear, you're just noting your desire for the city to look at corner yards and front yard fences. I don't believe you are saying that you would be supportive of any necessarily change to front yard fences on the corner yard, only that you were open to looking at them further. Correct. Okay. I, at this point, I, I'm, I'm not you know, in the position to be able to make a decision like I, I just basically want to see um because we have an applicant who who said look I, I feel like there's all these issues there's light issues there's noise issue there's security issues and I just wonder if if it's worthwhile to sort of take in a deeper dive into this um, and seeing if that is in fact the case are there other cities that have done this um because again, I, as, as I as I drive around, I, I do see fences that are pretty similar to that. So I don't know if there is a larger discussion that needs to happen, um, but you know I would be okay of of continuing this conversation and taking a look at an ordinance at the same time. But again, I'm just one person in this commission, so if there isn't any support for that, that's quite all right. I just want to put that out there because I do think that. Perhaps there is a need to have a larger conversation. Commissioner Vincent. Yeah, I, I'm not saying they can't have a fence. They could go for the minor exception and possibly get the four foot fence. It could probably be constructed in a way to provide the safety they're looking for. And there's always the option of landscaping to block some of the lighting. Okay, Commissioner Weiler. Um, as a commissioner that is owned and lived in houses that are on fairly busy through streets, both originally as a regular frontage home with houses on either side and now as a corner lot, corner lots, uh, in my opinion, do have their own set of challenges. And there's stuff that you cannot imagine until you've actually lived there street sleepers choosing to take their half hour break in front of your house because there's a pull out with the corner at 2 a.m. for instance. Um, these are things that a normal buyer cannot discover during the inspection process. Um, the light thing too, I did, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's headlight manufacturers decided to crank things up to 11. Um, it, it seems like in my experience, there is challenges there. That being said, like uh, Chair Colton said, It'd be a totally different uh, conversation if this was coming to us beforehand. I think that there might be some validity to considering corner lot implications because um, 
in a housing market where you're looking for a place. These are things that you really know until you've lived uh, there. Uh, can't support the variance as it is. I think the applicant needs to work with staff. Um, I could see the fence maybe being allowed with some of the modifications that were proposed at three or four feet, both for safety and um, maybe blocking or reducing sunlight. Uh, one of the big arguments was child safety. So I think a four foot fence would be reasonable for allowing for that. And uh, the steel posts full for the cars that in the past have come careening off of Pleasant Hill Road. Um, but I think at this point, I would say staff's recommendation, deny the variance, instruct the applicant to work with staff on the minor exception. And I would tell staff, um, maybe be sympathetic towards their design. Um, headlights are pretty aggressive these days. Um, I've experienced it myself. So just be that as a man. Okay. Anyone else? Commissioner Cheney. Um. I just wanted to say thanks to Commissioner Weiler. I think you very much captured my perspective on it as well as that I, I think that um, the variance doesn't meet the current zoning intent, but I, I very much want to find a good solution for them and, and think that uh, pursuing a minor exception could be the way to, to go forward because I think um, having a, a, a three or four foot tall fence that keeps them safe, that keeps the light out, that uh, does some of the work that they're looking to do, I think is, is worthwhile. So I, I, appreciate I think that you said it better than I'm saying it right now so uh, I'm I'm on board with with what you just shared okay thank you um so Troy if we were to deny the variance tonight uh what are the next steps for the applicant in terms of defense how how will that be handled uh, well, if the commission denies the request, there is, of course, a potential appeal that the applicant could file to the city council. Uh, but assuming everything stands and the, the denial happens, uh, we would then talk to the applicant and work out timing to modify that. And hopefully we can do it in a reasonable time frame. But we would work with the applicant to uh, work to that. Okay, so that so that would mean taking it down to four feet. Well, they would have to decide to submit for a minor exception. And if I recall correctly, I don't know if the applicant, at least previously, was open to looking at a minor exception. But Andrew can correct me if I'm wrong. But tonight's discussion may change that. But yes, if they were to pursue a four foot tall fence, then they would have to submit for a minor exception. And if that was the case, then once again, we would work with the applicant to figure out timing to, if it was if it was approved to get it to that appropriate height. Okay. Andrew, do you, um, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I don't have anything additional to add. I, I think the applicant was, you know, reasonably open to pursuing a minor exception, but they're, Thoughts may have changed since our discussion. Um, that was one of the options they provided on the attached uh, contractor's estimate. So I know that's something that they did at least pursue uh, with a contractor. I believe they were trying to get more estimates as well, just so they could get a variety of, of estimate or quotes on the on the work. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so it looks like I might be the only one here that's sort of thinking about uh, pausing this further. So I'll entertain a motion from anyone because I think everyone has said what they want to say. And uh, I have a feeling I know where this commission stands. So if anyone wants to make a motion, um, I will entertain that at, that, at, at this point. Commissioner Vincent. I'll make a motion that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution uh, denying a variance request, PLN 22-0294, for a six-foot tall fence within a required front yard in an R10 residential zoning district at 2029 Westover Drive. Okay. Commissioner Vavrick, did you have a question or are you- no, I'll, I'll just second it. Okay. 
Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Vincent and a second by Commissioner Vavrick. Can we have a roll call, please? Uh, before we take roll call, it just dawned on me. I don't know. For denials, we usually do it either with prejudice or without prejudice. And it's not enough there's a desire by the commission to tag it one way or the other. Can uh, you just remind us really quickly again? Um, without, preju without prejudice means they can submit within a year. Uh, with prejudice means they would have to wait. Although with the variance, it's a little unique because I don't know how you change the application <laughs> to come back for a variance. So I, I would make it with prejudice. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Uh, I'm sorry. Who made the second? My mind. Uh, Commissioner Fabric. Yeah. Oh, thank you. All right. Commissioner Chiang. Yes. Commissioner Cheney. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Vavrick. Yes. Commissioner Vincent. Yes. Commissioner Weiler. Yes. And Chair Colton. No. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. So uh, moving on to item number two. Item number two is PLN 22-0387, Madero's minor exception at 161 Belly Avenue. I will open up the staff, um, the public hearing and ask for a staff report. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Tonight before you, I'll be presenting a minor exception request at the Madero's residence, um, which is at 161 Bell Avenue. Um, so the proposal before you tonight is a minor exception for a reduced aggregate side setback. Um, this is in association with a 962 square foot addition to the rear of the property. Um, the existing home is 1,115 square feet. Um, so the resulting aggregate setback as proposed tonight would be 12 foot 6 inches, where 15 feet is required by the ordinance. And just to clarify, the aggregate setback, side setback is a um, sum of the two side yards. Um, and so this represents a 16.7% reduction. The minor exception allows up to a 20% reduction. So they qualify um, to apply. Um, and then I will just highlight, um, and I'll point this out on a site plan, that the existing home already has a um, existing non-conforming aggregate side setback. And so this proposal would be increasing that by two feet, five inches, and that'll become more clear um, on the site plan. But just to orient us, so this property is located at uh, 161 Bell Avenue, just east of Dorothy Drive. Um, it is located in the R10 single family lot, um, our single family zone, and has a 0.17 acre lot, um, so substandard in size. Um, and it's also narrow and rectangular in shape. Um, the property just next door at 161 Bell Avenue um, just west is uh, identical in size and shape. Um, however, the rest of the properties within the general vicinity um, all tend to comply with the R10 10,000 square foot lot uh, size um, as well as the uh, lot width. Here are just some images of the home as existing today, front of the house looking from Bell Avenue, and then pictures of the rear. I mentioned this is a rear addition. Um, so here is the existing conditions at the rear. And so here's a site plan um, proposed. The uh, gray, solid gray um, is the existing home. And then the new addition is hatched um, at the rear of the property. So as I mentioned, the existing um, house currently has um, an existing uh, non-conforming uh, side setback um, where five feet is required. The existing house currently sits at four foot eight inches. Um, the new addition would actually be complying, be, be bringing that up to compliance um, and meeting the five foot minimum. Um, and then uh, the existing house also has a um, existing non-conforming aggregate side setback. Um, and as I mentioned, and you can see this at the, um, the top um, of the site plan, um, would be further reducing that setback to a seven foot six inch, um, which would result then in a cumulative um, increase in the nonconformity of two foot five inches. Um, so I did mention this is a rectangular, narrow rectangular lot. Um, I will provide some um, 
development standards in a minute, but just uh, to highlight, it is substandard in width, but it does exceed the lot depth um, requirements for the zone. And so what that um, leaves is a larger space in the front yard and larger space in the rear yard um, that is currently open um, and not proposed for development at this time. Um, the interior kind of patched rectangle area shows the setback lines. And so it will show the buildable area within that rectangle. Um, so as I mentioned, here's some just standard development regulations. I'll just highlight a few that I've uh, shown in orange here. So as I mentioned, it's a legal non-conforming site um, and a legal non-conforming lot width. Um, it's 50 feet wide where 80 feet is required. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the side setback um, existing is four foot inch, eight inches minimum. So they will be bringing that up to compliance with a five foot. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the aggregate setback goes from a 14 foot one to a 12 foot six. Um, here's the floor plan. And I'm, I'm showing this because um, minor exceptions do require certain findings. The main one um, that we're seeking direction and feedback on tonight is um, whether there's any practical alternatives that um, exist for the homeowner to construct the addition that would meet otherwise meet setbacks. Um, the applicant has provided a narrative in your packet with their justification um, as to what that, why there is no practical alternative. And a lot of their reasoning has to do with the interior floor plan um, and stating that because the lot is already narrow and long, um, creating a addition that would comply would create in uh, would result in long and narrow rooms, um, a lot of hallway circulation space, um, and rooms that are hard to furnish. And so that um, the applicant is here and we'll be addressing that later on, but I wanna highlight that in the floor plan um, that they are pr uh, proposing this minor exception to create a more usable interior space. Um, I'll highlight some elevations here just to show ex existing at the top and um, proposed at the bottom. Um, so there is a minor um, implication to the front yard. You see where that um, new addition pokes out that two foot, uh, five inches further to the side. Um, and then it's really the side elevations that you see the new addition area. Here is the left elevation. This is the compliant five yard, uh, five foot side yard setback. And then the right elevation. And this is the um, site that is, or the side yard that is seven foot, eight inches and the rear elevation here. So as I mentioned, there's several findings that have to be made tonight. Um, the, the first one I bolded, no practical alternative exists to the proposed exception. Um, and that's really what staff is seeking feedback on from the commission tonight. Um, you might've noticed there's no resolution um, in your packet. Staff is here just to seek direction and feedback. Um, and then we'll work with the applicant accordingly, given the direction we receive. Um, the other findings are that the intent of the zoning district um, will not be compromised, that there'll be no detrimental impacts to the site um, or adjacent properties in the neighborhood, um, and that it'll be in substantial conformance with the city-wide design guidelines. Um, just some discussion points uh, for tonight. As I mentioned, the subject property is already substandard in width um, by 37.5% and in total area by 25%. And they're seeking that minor exception to reduce the aggregate setback um, by 16.7%. Um, I did mention the site plan includes large front and rear yards that are open for development currently, um, where they may be able to make a, um, an addition that complies with setbacks. Um, and I'll just note that the besides the aggregate setback, the addition complies with all of their development standards. Um, and again, we're really just looking for for general feedback on the proposal as a whole, um, but for focus on um, the, the practical alternatives and if they exist um, with an addition that would meet setbacks. Um, so right now we're just seeking feedback um, and input from the commission. Um, and as I mentioned, we will return um, if directed and, and as directed to um, for you tonight. And the applicant, the homeowner is here tonight as well, um, but I'm here if you have any questions, thanks. Thank you, Haley. Um, is the applicant here? I mean, obviously they're here, but uh, Larry, can you bring the applicant in just in case we have questions? One moment, please. Thank you.
the applicant is in the room. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay. So does the commission have questions, any questions for the applicant or for staff? Uh, Commissioner Weiler and then Commissioner Chang. Hi, thank you for coming tonight. <clears throat> um, I was taking a look at the plans. Um, it's a pretty substantial addition that you're doing there in the back of the house. Um, this reminds me a lot of my addition I did at my old house. Are you going to be substantially working on the front of the house or is the idea not to touch the front couple bedrooms and living room? You're on mute. I, cost-wise, and I, I'm thinking that, that might be a future phase, but I had originally had a plan where I was going to take the roof off front to back. I was going to move the kitchen, but the garage is an impingement because I need to keep the, in, in the garage. So I'm kind of stuck with one fixture where I have to build around it or build another garage, which I have a lot of front of the house buildable space, but that's a pretty significant design and cost, one that I'm not at a place where I can afford to do. So I've sort of simplified this to keep it more of a, I, having a second bedroom and a third, or a third, third bedroom and a second bathroom, plus having a usable family room where I can have more than two people in it without you know knocking into each other. Is the house a raised foundation in the garage pad? Yes. So to reconfigure and build into the front of the house, you'd, you'd be busting up foundation in a pretty significant way then. To build on off the front, well, building off because the front would be building a garage potentially, but I, you know, I'm not in love with an idea of like making the garage my front feature of my house. Um, it, you know, it's kind of challenging with, a, again, with a, the lot width, and I don't want to have a second, I don't want a two-story house um, for, for a multitude of reasons. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, before we go to Commissioner Chang, uh, let me ask the applicant, did you, do you have a presentation to make or you just want to be here for questions? I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm just here to participate. I okay. didn't have anything Perfect. specific yeah. other than what I've I didn't ask you, so, okay, perfect. Um, Commissioner Chang, go ahead, please. Yes, my question is for staff. So from the um, plan, the proposed plan with the new addition, if the, uh, I don't know which side of it is, but the, the side that is approximately two feet proud of the existing face, um, if that face were in alignment with the existing face, and the aggregate side yard, um, I'm sorry, side yard setback were consistent, would this applicant be needing a minor exception? So if the um, new addition was built in um, line with the existing um, house, there would still be a small, um, they would still be seeking a minor exception for a, um, it would be substandard by seven inches. Um, whereas now, um, it, you know, it's substandard by, substandard by more. And so it would still require a minor exception. They would have to bring the addition in an additional seven inches from where the um, current house setback is located. And if they did that and they had a 15 foot aggregate setback, then they would no longer need a minor exception, but bringing it just in line with the existing home would still require a minor exception. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Any more questions for staff or the applicant? Commissioner Vavrik. You are, you're on mute. Um, what then is the setback on the west side of the property. I mean, we've been discussing the aggregate setbacks, but just to confirm like what the distance to the neighbors would be here. So I'm, I'm concerned about the west side because I think that's the smaller. So the east side um, would actually be the smaller and that is five feet. Currently, the house on that east side is four foot eight inches. 
So they're bringing it a few inches further away from the property line. Okay. Um, and then on the west side, the proposed setback is seven foot six inches. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Vincent. Uh, the issue we're addressing is whether there's a practical alter alternative uh, exists to the proposed exception. Does anyone have any thoughts on if there are alternatives? I mean, you're going to end up with a hot dog looking house by squeezing it and stretching it out, I think. I was trying to compare how this would look like a double wide, I think, would be close because of how narrow the lot is. Um, it looks like double wides are about 32 feet, maybe for modern standards. And our requirements on this home would dictate a house no wider than 35 feet with a garage. If someone tried to develop this to meet our current design standards with a two-car garage and everything else, I, I don't I don't know how you would pass <laughs> that. Um the only thing I could see for a practical alternative is stretching this thing way the heck out. Or would going up solve that issue? Well, probably would, but I think he indicated he did not want to do right. a second story. Right. Commissioner Johnson. Um, I was just wondering what is the actual purpose of the aggregate setback? And the only reason I'm asking is because um, I totally understand the restrictions on this property with the dimensions and everything. Um, I think it it could be it could meet the standards with some creativity. It would take some creativity for sure, um, but there are definitely some limitations. But I'm wondering what the actual purpose of the side setback is, and if it's to prevent, um, if it's to respect your neighbors, is that really a question considering that the the adjacent property is two stories and just kind of towers over his so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the intent of the aggregate setback um so the minimum side setback is five feet and then the aggregate would be 15 um and that is you know i think for a few reasons one yes for um you know to address uh privacy and um you know locating massing of buildings away from adjacent um, neighbors and things like that. But also I think from a street pattern, you know, presence to have some variation there um, with some a little bit, you know, um, white, potentially wider spaces on one side and more narrow setbacks and have that kind of repeating pattern throughout the a, a neighbor, single family residential neighborhood. It just adds some variability. Um, that being said, though, there's no requirement that they must have a minimum five foot setback. They could go larger. Um, you know, they could have uh, seven feet on one and, you know, larger on the other. So um, it's, you know, in there to kind of help with that. Um, but again, there's, there is no guarantee that a property would be built that way. Um, so I hope that that kind of helps. Yes, hey, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I see two hands up and I'm just thinking that they were from before. No, mine's um, new. Oh, new. Okay. Um, I'll let Diana go first. Well, just because this was um, part of uh, Commissioner Johnson's maybe question, you know, I was thinking about the whole issue that you just brought up, which had to do with why do we have those side side yard setbacks? And um, Haley gave some of the reasons, but I think over time, what we've learned is that there just needs to be some um, there needs to be some space on either side of homes in order to accomplish other things as well. And, you know, that oftentimes has to do with drainage, with moving materials from front to back, um, you know, screening of one kind or another in a tight space like this, that could be an issue um, with the neighbors. And um, noise reduction, uh, I think that, you know, it, it may seem like a small, um, dimension, but basically having some additional um, feet or inches in there sometimes provides for a solution to help people to live more peacefully side by side, quite frankly. 
I mean, I think, you know, these side guard setbacks are, um, are very important. You know, there's also the issue of dealing with um, light intrusion, one property to another and noise. And it just gives, you know, the, uh, having that aggregate 15 foot setback really does give, um, I think, you know, a better neighborhood in terms of livability and functionality for the lot itself. So they, it seems like small dimensions, but I think when you're actually living there um, and living next door to it, having some space makes a big difference. So the issue before us is, are there alternatives to this site plan? And, you know, because this lot is so deep, um, you know, it's in my opinion that there probably are alternatives, that this is not the only solution um, and, you know, there could be more construction going on in the future on this site because it does have a lot of opportunity. It may be narrow, but it's long. And, um, and I think that there are a number of things that beyond this particular proposal could be done on the property. But I would like to see some consistency in the setbacks. And I, and I, I just, I, at this point, I'm not convinced that this current design is the only one that's viable out there. Commissioner Vincent. Uh, my question was, I, I assume the neighbors were giving notice of this hearing? Yes, we did notify the standard 300 foot radius um, and we received no public comment. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions for staff and or applicant commissioner cheney yeah i i think i feel similarly that i as i look at the proposed floor plan i feel like there are other options in terms of of where things could be that could reduce that uh, additional two foot step out that goes to the to the west just feeling like there's some opportunity to maybe put the primary bedroom uh, attached to the great room on the, the backyard side, which could also create space for that closet and that bathroom could then stay in the same place it is. So I feel like there are alternatives to maybe just explore and it might not work, but I, as I'm looking at this, I feel like there are, are ways that this could be tweaked with all that backyard space, maybe not have that additional two foot step out on the west side. Thank you. Would you would you, would you like to respond? Sure. I I mean I this this is like the fourth set of plans. I've spent a significant amount of money trying to plan for this. Most cities have a five foot setback. Aggregate setbacks, while I understand them for large lots, this is a very small lot. And so having a small home on a narrow lot, you're, the commissioner mentioned about a double wide. I've lived in this house for four four years, over four and a half years. It's a difficult lot to furnish. When I first moved here, I had an interior designer come in. She looked in all these narrow spaces and said, these are difficult to furnish. They're difficult to populate for more than one or two people because of the narrowness of them. Creating more spaces with a garage that I'm stuck with. I had a design where I moved into the garage, but I, when I initially presented that to the city, I was told, Oh, you got to keep your garage. So I'm gonna build a new garage. I can't move to to I can't widen my house if I'm stuck with these pinch points. If I narrow that bedroom and go out further, well, yes, I do have a lot in the backyard, but I would like some backyard. I then have to create hallway spaces to access points. None of this is ideal for me. Ultimately, I don't prefer to have my bedroom access through the living room, period. That's why I had to create a little area to make some more access and, and, and create a little separation. If I had my ideal world, I would keep all the bedrooms parked on one side, but unfortunately I can't stretch this lot. Um, to answer to the neighboring areas, this is 80 feet from the street, so it's, and it's a very low home. So it has very minimal visibility. There's a brand new home that's just been built next door, a developer that's going to be sold. When I started this plan, that house was, a 600 square foot house on the very far corner of the of the end of this lot. So I started this in my designs began in spring of 2021. My initial presentation and sending this lot is this is I'm almost a year into like 
design changes. I, if this was in another part of the city where the lot size, you know, is smaller and more often homes, I would have, which oftentimes in most cities is just a five foot setback, which is a very common setback. In some cities, say for example, Oakland, granted I know that this isn't Oakland, if you have a narrow lot, you actually have a narrow lot line exceptions where you actually can go even smaller. If I was building an ADU, I can build three feet to the, the property line. So there's all these kind of things that don't really kind of jive with me a practical understanding for myself. If I lop two feet off of my great room and get rid of the bathroom toilet closet, I'll actually be in compliance. But how does that affect anybody? I would make a, a zigzag in my house. I would be in compliance, but it wouldn't really affect anyone. The house next door, you know, it, there's a big, big house next door. It towers over my house. Excuse me. The other, the lot on the other side is what a quarter acre plus, more than twenty thousand square feet, with a with a probably non-conforming outbuilding that is not that is sheltered from my house. So none of these things are really going to affect neighborhood. I would venture to guess it's pretty hard to establish how it's going to affect any curbside aesthetic given the distance away from the street. So I'm just trying to understand like, sure, I could I could I make an elongated house that's considerably longer with more long rooms that are all, you know, it's like a fuselage. It's not going to get me to a very comfortable home design. It's it, I'm just kind of going in circles to meet a a requirement that while I understand it, like you don't want to overbuild like the 20 or the 4,000 square foot house over here, that though that's on a you know 20,000 square foot lot, I'm not like impacting anything around me. And it, really the greatest impact is just on me to building something that, you know, just sort of furthers along an already difficult design. Okay. Um any other questions from the commission? Okay. Is there anyone in the public that would like to make a comment at this point? We have no hands raised or phone calls at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay, and again, to comment, uh, www.zoom.us, uh, webinar ID is 882-8025-0550, passcode 362091 or by telephone at 669-900-6833, star nine to raise your hand and get in the queue. Uh, let me just check back in with Larry again to see if anyone else. Yeah. No one's got the hand up. Okay, uh, so before I close the public hearing, any additional questions mm -hmm. for the applicant at this point? Commissioner Weiler, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Real quick, you said this was your fourth revision, I think, to the plans, and it's been over a year. I take it you've been working with staff to try and meet the requirements that they've been giving you feedback on? Yeah, no, I originally, I, I, I was originally, you know, I talked to Andrew a few times, and we had gone over, like, a few different things. He pointed out things to me that the city re required. My uh, original designer is moved to Southern California, and he's no longer involved in the project. So I've been taking over some of the redesign and then working with an engineer to complete it. So that, you know, so th these are the things he introduced me to the minor exception and felt like it was reasonable consideration to it to pursue. Um, and that's why I went ahead and considered moving forward with this direction. Um, I've invested a lot in this design. Uh, so this, you know, that's why I continue to go forward with it. I, these currently are a fully engineered set of plans. Um, so these, so. these would be ready for submission to build in with a minor exception pretty quickly. Then. I mean, this is, if it wasn't for this this thing, this would have hopefully already been built, you know, um, you know, last year. So thank you. Okay. Any more questions for the applicant? No. Okay. Uh, Larry, just last check in. Anyone in the queue? for this item? No, sir. Okay, thank you. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and close the public hearing, uh, bring it back for commission for further discussion and consideration. Um, thank you, Mr. Medeiros. Am I saying that correct? Okay. I hope so. Um, 
Okay, uh, who wants to start? Uh, Commissioner okay. Vincent. Uh, the issue tonight is whether we can make the finding that there's no practical alternative that exists to, to the proposed exception. And really based on the discussion, the only alternative is to add a second story. And he's indicated that's not something he wants to do and it would cost quite a bit. So uh, this is a tough one. I'm having a hard time with this one, but, but I, at this point, don't see an alternative. Okay, Commissioner Johnson. Um, I do find this one challenging. Um, or I find myself conflicted because on the one hand, um, his property is already legally non-compliant. Um, and so to then ask for his addition to be in compliance seemed, I find it difficult, a little challenging to request of him. But then if I look at, you know, if I look at it from like, if there were an emergency similar to previous, if there were an emergency, I couldn't imagine requesting a police officer or a firefighter to have to, you know, negotiate the side of his property with just three feet. Um, most access right of ways, most access routes um, are typically, you know, you try to make them at least four feet so that people can venture through them back and forth easily. Um, I do agree that there is ample space to um, manipulate or to, to utilize. Um, so I feel like there, you know, like I said, with the little creativity, it could be accomplished, but it, it is gonna be a challenge, um, especially for if, if you're not having an architecture and an engineer working on these plans together. So that's just my little two cents. Commissioner Weiler. Thank you. I remember to use that hand instead of this one. Um, I don't think it's three feet. The Commissioner Johnson's point, it looks like it's seven and a half feet. And that was actually the first thing I thought of too, is having one of the two side setbacks be wide enough for reasonable access. I mean, when it comes time to put in your backyard, you want to be able to get a bobcat back there, um, small tract equipment, what have you. <clears throat> Uh, that being said, it looks like where he's pushing out is going to be roughly in line with an existing gas meter. Uh, existing gas meter is going to be the pinch point there. So as far as getting access or equipment, it seems to be in line with that. Um, Madero's application reminds me a lot of a very similar project I went through. Um, when you're a homeowner trying to design it and do it yourself and understand the rules and going through everything and maybe working with a designer who's not familiar or local to the area. Um, there can be a lot of frustrations involved. And the fact that this is on revision four, uh, that he cannot go up likely because of cost. I mean, I think when I got a quote to try and add a second story to my last house, the foundation requirements added something like $200,000. That's just for the foundation and strengthening the walls and doing all that. Um, he's not touching the front of the house whatsoever, which tells me that this is cost constrained. So from a practical alternative standpoint, if he had the ability to reconfigure this and make it happen, he would have done so. Um, I was in his shoes. I had a whole front of a house totally untouched and only working in the back. So that's one of the things that I'm seeing there. Um, so from a practical alternative, I don't think that there is one. I mean they would have had a better alternative on their third revision before coming to us now with their fourth revision. If other people whose job it is, even his designer were already looking at it, they would have been able to figure it out. So um, I think that this is probably the best that it can get within reason and within cost. Okay, um, thank you for that, Commissioner Weiler. Anyone else wants to comment on this? Okay. So we don't have to take action today. I think this is a direction item. Um, I feel similar to what Commissioner Vincent and Commissioner Weiler had said. Um, I think considering the fact that applicant has put forth an effort the fourth time to, to sort of make this work, um, I feel like there's a good, good faith effort here. And, you know, from my personal perspective, um, I think going up to second floor is not always the best option either. Um, I mean, 
cost is one, but also, you know, as folks get older, um, navigating the stairs becomes an issue. So I, 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 I understand why um, he may not want to go that route. Um, the struggle I have, though, it, it does sound a little bit more of, you know, a preference versus an alternative possibility. Um, but I think we can have that discussion almost any time. And certainly, if someone's trying to do something to their property, they're going to have a preference of which way they want to go. So I don't want to sort of blame them for that because um, I too would probably want to avoid going up. Um, so in my opinion, I, I second what Commissioner Vincent was saying um, and Commissioner Weiler. I, I just don't see a reasonable alternative that's going to get this project over the line. Um, so I'll, you know, with that, I'll stop and see if anyone else has anything else to add. I see Troy. Uh, yeah, Chair Colton, the applicant has their hand up. I know you closed public comment, so it's entirely up to you whether you would like to hear him speak again. Okay. Um, so um, let me go ahead and open public hearing again. Um, uh, his hand went down. Okay. All right. See, so we didn't have to do that. So we never opened the public hearing. Um, anyone else wants to come in here? So, um, Troy, are you getting, and Haley, are you guys getting enough direction here, or do or do we need more? Uh, I've heard from, three. I think I count three commissioners. Yep. Um, you know, it'd be ideal if we could hear from a majority. Okay, Commissioner Chang. I will speak on be and follow on what Commissioner Johnson has noted that working with an architect and an engineer um, to come up with a creative solution, there will there is a creative solution here that I think maybe has not yet been explored. I understand that the applicant is under cost constraints. However, when you do try to do things yourself and it is not your area of expertise, you may not see options that are uh, apparent to a professional. So I would be in favor, and I'm sorry you've already been through four rounds of plan revision, but I would be in favor of working with staff and working with your designers to come up with an alternate creative solution. Okay, so it sounds like we have two commissioners that believe there's an alternative and three that believe that there isn't. So Commissioner Vaverick. I'm gonna weigh in with what Commissioner Chang said. I think there it probably is a solution here. I'm sorry that it's gone through this many revisions. However, um, you know, the the ordinance has remained the same throughout this process. So um, I have to think that, you know, for whatever reason, um, the applicant just has not submitted a design that wouldn't require this type of um, approval. So I, I think that there is a creative solution here. It's a narrow lot, but there are many narrow lots. Um, I think we're not quite as used to them in Pleasant Hill, but in other cities that are quite narrow, and there's a lot of good design that's done on those lots. So I have to um, I have to say that I I do think that there's a practical alternative here. Okay, uh, thank you. I see Commissioner Vincent's back on with his hand up. I would just add a thought because the issues before us tonight, and it says no practical alternative exists. And I think what we're saying now is, well, we don't know the a practical alternative, but keep coming back till you have one. I mean, at some point we need to make a decision. How much money is he going to spend for us to say no 10 times? Well, uh, Commissioner well, Baverick, did you have something to add? Yeah, I did have something. You know, I'm looking at this, um, you know, this is a 50 foot wide lot. So well, again, while it's narrow by, you know, the standards of Pleasant Hill, um, there are many towns that have 50 foot wide lots that are that have been, you know, basically subdivided, you know, many years ago, and people are working with those lots. And as I said, um, you know, coming up with with really viable designs, designs that are practical, <laughs> you know, so. But, um, but part of the issue, too, is the 15 foot setback, right? Like, 
those narrow lots have five foot or zero lot lines. It's a lot not, more to work with. Or not, you, all not all of them. I mean, it's city to city. Yeah. You know, um, but, you know, so I, I think it's, it's just hard for me to make the finding that there's no practical alternative here. Okay, so um, Commissioner Vincent. Well, I, I would just respond that if we tell them there's no practical, there is a practical alternative. We'd have to say, no, there isn't. Because if, if we say that, if we say there is an alternative, we need to be prepared to tell them what it is. I don't think we're pre prepared to do that. I don't think that's our job. That's the job of a professional to tell, yeah. to work with the applicant to find a creative alternative. It is not the, um, I don't believe it's the job of the planning commission to say there is no practical alternative. Well, let me just add to that, but yet here we are um, on this issue, trying to see if there is one or there isn't. So I totally get your point, Commissioner Chang, um, but I do sort of think that, um, I mean, to Commissioner Vincent's point, um, at some point, how long, I mean, how long do we continue to do this? Um, I see Commissioner Johnson, and I would love to hear from Commissioner Cheney if possible, because um, I, I I can see his thinking. So, go ahead, Commissioner Johnson. Um, I just I I I don't think we should be required to tell them what the alternative is, um, but I do think we should. We, I feel comfortable saying there's room for improvement. I do feel bad that, you know, this process has been a lengthy process for him and his family's growing. I, I totally get all of that. Um, but from a professional standpoint, um, I definitely see options available uh, for this property that, um, that would be able to satisfy the requirements to take property in just the two feet. Um, sorry to take the, the residence in the two feet that that's being requested. Um, but again, I still have that conflict where, you know, it's already legally non-compliant. <laughs> so I find it hard to be so strict on him when, you know, he does have all these limitations. He does have the pinch points. He said that he is interested in potentially expanding the front of the house at a future time. Um, but right now, this is what he's currently presenting. And um, I totally understand the conundrum here. I think hearing from the adjacent neighbor who, whose um, personal space may be impeded, at, like if they wrote something saying that they're content with, you know, having the property bump out the two feet, I think I'd feel a little bit better about saying, yeah, go ahead and do this because the reality is that he, the neighbor is being affected. Um, whether we, you know, I, two feet doesn't sound like a lot, but they are being affected with this bump out too, so. And, and just to confirm, Haley, we did notify the neighbor, correct? Yep, all neighbors okay. were notified, yep. Okay, Commissioner Weiler. I'd also like to throw out there just for the commission to consider. If this were a new development coming before us, which we've seen many of, we've approved four foot setbacks. We've approved back to back five foots. There are two houses behind me that are 3,700 square feet with 10 feet on the nose between the two of them and aggregate side yard setbacks that have exceptions for various reasons as part of a planned unit development. Um, there are lots of other places in the city where seven and a half feet would be an improvement on a setback. So I, I want to also be mindful too of the fact that there was a good faith effort here. This applicant is doing everything right, going through the process, it's working with staff, following our guidelines as best as they can, making revisions. Um, we don't want to discourage residents and citizens of Pleasant Hill to do the right thing and feel like we're being an impediment in multiple cases. Um, I mean, the gas meter, I think, is going to be at the same thing. We don't, we don't have those same requirements on anything mechanical. 
he could stuff an oversized AC unit there in that same setback area, and the building department's not going to say anything. He could put a well there. He could put a hot tub there, even. Um, I think that the two PSC could the impact. Heck, if he decided to abandon this project completely, he could build an 800 square foot additional dwelling unit, three foot from the fence, and we could say nothing about it. So it is good to consider the practical alternatives here. Um, would, can we make a hot dog design? Sure. Would it actually be feasible and would he build it? Maybe not. I mean, I can't imagine living with a couple of kids in a squished down home. The looks like the dining room is barely going to touch nine feet. After you put a table, chairs, like the width on some of these rooms is going to be really challenging. I do, I do see where those are coming from. Uh, Chair Colston, the applicant, yes. has his hand up again. Okay, I, I just think we need to push forward through the comments here and, and, and just come to a place where we can give you some direction. If I think if I go back and open up public hearing, we're just going to continue to to do the same thing. Um, so I see Commissioner Cheney here. Um, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I mean, sympathetic to both the, the size of the lot and the fact that you don't want a long hot dog house. Um, also, I, I note that um, Commissioner Weiler said, you know, there, there's other things already in the way, and, and we might notice the plan has the AC unit essentially within that two feet on the west side. So th this is a, a small thing, and, and it is already non-conforming. Um, I'm just very mindful of if we are to say the bar to get over is that there are not viable alternatives. I don't think I'm there yet. Um, okay. you know, I, I think if it might not be a design that is the most preferable, but if we take out that hallway and linen closet and we'll make that bedroom, and then move the walk-in closet to the back side of the great room, that can solve the space. Um, and that would, you know, eliminate the French doors off the great room, which is not ideal, but to me, this is a, a viable alternative that solves for the, the encroaching on the setback more. Closely. Um, it might not be a, a preferable design, but to me, there are viable alternatives. And if our hurdle to get over is, we would say yes to this because there are, are no good alternatives. I don't think I'm there yet. Um, so I, 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 I'm sympathetic to the issue. I, I think that there has been a good faith effort uh, knowing that this, this fourth iteration carries a lot of weight for me that we've already pursued solutions. Um, I, I'm just not sure that, that this is the right one. Yet. Okay. Um, so what I'm hearing is we have four commissioners that believe there's an alternative and three that believe that there isn't. Um, Haley and Troy, um, what are your thoughts on the next step? Do we want to maybe move forward with two options and pick one later, or have we given you enough to, to make a decision? Uh, I think... Uh, we've heard from the commission in general, and to me, it seems like the majority would prefer to have the applicant further explore options that do not require a minor exception, not necessarily saying that the minor exception at the end of the day wouldn't be approved, but I think I'm hearing from the majority that there may be other options that are available that do not necessitate a minor exception and you would like the applicant to further explore that. And so based on my, you know, assumption of and my guess of what the majority is saying, I think staff would recommend that you continue this um, to a later meeting. And we would want to talk with the applicant to find out, you know, the next meeting is theoretically in two weeks. Is that enough time? We don't know. Um, and so, I, I mean, I do think there should be a continuation to allow the applicant time to further explore that. Um, I, I just don't know if we would continue it to a specific date at this time, because I don't know what would be, what the time frame would be. And so we could continue it to the, a month from now. And if it's not ready, we could just continue it. Um, that would be my initial thought. Okay. 
Um, I mean, that that sounds to me, that sounds good to me. I, I you know, we're not making a decision today. Um, so again, my thoughts, and, and I said them already, I, I just, I don't want to create endless amount of barriers to do something that I think ultimately applicants trying to do the right thing here. So, but, you know, there's other people in this commission. So uh, I'm, I am comfortable with moving forward to a different day, um, you know, which the staff can decide when, when you speak to, to the applicant, if everyone's okay with that, then perhaps that's, that's the route we take. I see a couple of hands, Commissioner Vincent. I'm okay with that because it does take us through the process to see if there is an alternative. So that's fine. And I just want to say, I appreciate all the comments everybody made tonight, because this was, for me, it was a hard decision to make. So I appreciate everybody's input. So thank you. Thank you. But, but I'm fine with the continuance. Commissioner Vavrick. I'm fine with the continuance as well. And I would just ask that, um, you know, I particularly <clears throat> appreciated Commissioner Cheney's um, you know, just kind of quick look at this. Um, and I would hope that, you know, the applicant would take some of that into consideration. I mean, we don't design projects here and, but, you know, it basically, uh, at this point in time, um, I, you know, I certainly could not, I, I think that there are practical alternatives and he quickly came up with just a, you know, off the top of his head. So I think that, you know, going to, to what Commissioner Chang said, working with an architect and an engineer, um, there may be some solutions that will come forward. Okay, uh, thank, thank you for that. Troy, um, you have enough direction, I'm assuming? Yeah, I will need a motion to continue this. Okay. And okay. You continue it to a date to be determined. We can okay. be noticed when it's ready. Um, does anyone like to make a motion? Okay. Well, I should clarify, would the commission like to continue it to the first meeting in February? Okay. I would like to make a motion to continue this item to the first week of February. First meeting, not first week. First meeting. I second. And if, and if that doesn't work, uh, it's not a problem that we can just continue it. So just so everyone understands doesn't mean it has to come that way. So first, okay. so meeting. just just to clarify, the motion was to continue this item to the first meeting of February. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Uh, I'm sorry again, who made the second? I think it was I. <laughs> who was? Commissioner Johnson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Chiang. Yes. Commissioner Cheney. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Vavrick. Yes. Commissioner Vincent. Yes. Commissioner Weiler. Yes. Chair Colfin. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, good meeting tonight. Um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is one of the better ones. Really, really good discussion. Um, okay, so moving on to uh, discussion items. So uh, review of pending planning applications. Sorry, Chair Culpin. Can we just for procedural purposes um, do item three and just take a vote to continue it? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so next item is um, RPM auto collection use permit at 3264 at Bus uh, Buskirk. Avenue. Um, I don't need to open up the public hearing because we pulled it, correct, Troy? No, you don't have to. The applicant has requested that this item be uh, continued to a date to be determined. And so there is no need to open public comment or have a discussion as the applicant has requested that this item not be heard at this time. Okay. Um, so someone willing to make a motion to continue this item to a date to be determined? I move to continue PLN 220284 RPM auto collection use permit at 3264 Park Avenue to a date yet to be determined. Second. Okay, uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Cheney and a second by Commissioner Weiler. Can we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Chiang? Yes. Commissioner Cheney? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Vavrick? Yes. 
Commissioner Vincent? Yes. Commissioner Weiler? Yes. Chair Colton? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Uh, moving on to an item that somebody on here really likes, uh, pending planning applications. The link wasn't on the uh, individual reports and um, function, by the way. Yep. Yeah, sorry about that. It's a huge loss for me. Well, I'll ask about Cambria Hotel. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I didn't ask this time. <laughs> that's okay. Um, we are expecting that, based on their information, they will be some resubmitting for a uh, building permit, maybe this month or early next month. Okay. Is the new um, Morgan Territory Brewery on our list of projects? No. Okay. Uh, um, they may not need, um, outside of architectural review, they may not need a... Okay. <laughs> Do we know when they're opening yet? No idea. Okay. Yeah, even our uh, economic development manager here for some of these questions, so... <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Babrick. Hey. Uh, Troy, how about the Starbucks over on Boulevard? You know, it, Starbucks is interesting. They were initially all gung ho and were moving on things, and then they kind of <laughs> a little snag. Um, so I don't. I know that they are still moving forward, but I think they're may, they may be trying to work through some things. And well, since Ryan is still here from our engineering group, I don't know if Ryan, have you heard anything? Uh, yeah, good evening, commissioners. Uh, Ryan Cook, senior engineer. Um, yeah, they're currently working through some issues with PG&E as related to a transformer relocation and of, which of kind of course. affects their drive through <laughs> aisle and they're trying to, <laughs> trying to do some things, so. Well, that explains a lot. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to staff communications. Uh, my only communication is I'm giving everyone a heads up that we will, well, I plan to have with you a study session, if you will, on the whole general plan that's been posted um, online late last month or mid last month. And two of you, have had extensive experience with being part of the GPAC. One of you, a former GPAC member, but Alan, I don't remember how far we got with you, but nonetheless. It's a couple of years, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. So we, we are planning to hold a study session, probably the first meeting of February to um, discuss and get your feedback. It's, it'll be a study session. It's not a formal hearing, but we thought that if we're going to be you know, moving forward this year to take action, it'd be great to get commission feedback. So I'm giving you all a heads up because the general plan is not a thin document. So you can use a good time for January and February to start kind of making your way through that. Some of you don't have to as much those on the feedback. So con yourself. Alex and I, we, we are writing so much. I'd love to do it again. So that's where we, do we have the walkability and bicycles coming up? Oh, yes, that will be coming at the next meeting. I think we posted on 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 our website on our website that you guys will be hearing it at our next meeting in January, which is the 24th. <clears throat> we'll also be holding a study session on the 24th on miscellaneous zoning ordinance. We have another long list of fixes and cleanups and clarifications for your consideration uh, study session on that. Was there no emergency ordinances caused by the state of California this year? Well, we did that already. Um, it didn't go to the planning commission because it was an urgency emergency uh, related to ADUs. Um, and we will have a separate ordinance amendment for ADUs because it's very important. We didn't want to mix it up with the miscellaneous ordinance amendment. So you will be seeing that one later this year. I thought maybe the state forgot about us this year. No, <laughs> amongst other things, they haven't forgotten us at all. Um, cool. Okay. Um, That's all my anything else. Cool. Uh, 
Commissioner reports and announcements. Okay. Um, Troy, I have one thing um, yes. that I wanted to put on your radar. Um, the U.S. Department of Transportation released a notice of funding opportunity um, on just a list of things. And one of them is a grant um, opportunity for pedestrian safety and for bicycle safety. And I think um, there might be some really good um, things in there to take a look at and maybe even partner up with other cities, um, you know, cities like Concord and Lafayette, maybe even at the county level. Um, so I know we're going to be talking about this um, issue. And I think taking a look at that, um, just to see how competitive we may or may not be and getting a sense of, um, do we want to go after a grant as a region, perhaps with multiple cities to address some of the bicycle safety measures and or pedestrian. I mean, I think they specifically call out things like gaps and sidewalks uh, and uh, measures for uh, protected bike lanes, things like that. So it, it, I just think it might be a good time to take a look at that. Ryan is also here. So he heard you, Chair Colfin, but thank you. And we will look into Let's, uh, Commission or Chair Colfin, we should link in like the uh, Bike East Bay and uh, there's also the Bike Pleasant Hill. Um, lots of advocacy groups that can help with that. Yeah, and I I imagine there's going to be a pretty significant list of folks that are going to be putting in. Um, and, you know, the question of non-federal match still needs to be addressed. So th that's why I say this may be kind of a regional thing as well, um, just to take a look at uh, what anything on the county level, um, just to start thinking about it. Because there's some time, but this is going to start coming up, right? Good. So. I would ask staff to maybe look into whether Measure K dollars can act as that federal match, and if we can perhaps coordinate with like our CCPA and Measure J dollar too. Uh, Troy, if it's helpful, I have a little cheat sheet of all the grants that USDOT is put out there, and it has all the requirements and background. I can send it your way if that's helpful. Um, sure. You know, yeah. But Okay. You can send it my way and that'd be great. Give these guys some homework. <laughs> and I hate to no. do that, to be honest with you, because you have enough to do. But I just think that because we're talking about this particular issue and because the DOT is providing a significant amount of funding, and it's not just going to be a one time thing. I think it's going to be a couple of years of it because um, some of it is through Infrastructure and Jobs Act. So, um, it's it's just a good thing to to and even if you're not successful this year, if you start lining up uh, folks to support it, you know I think there might be a good opportunity there because the stuff is pretty expensive. I mean, let's just be honest. It's it's you know folks don't realize how how much this kind of stuff costs. So, agreed. Any any help we can get would be positive. So that's all I have. Okay, That's very I guess cool. we thank should. You. I guess we should adjourn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for a really good meeting. I really enjoyed the conversation today, um, and hopefully everyone stays dry and uh, and not get flooded. That's. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. So uh, we are adjourned until uh, January 24th, 2023, 6 30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Good night. Good night, Larry. Good night. Good night, good night everybody. Bye, Larry.